something in a moment that might seem a little bit strange, but uh, you can trust me, I'm a doctor. Yeah. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to raise your eyebrows really high, like you're really surprised. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Hopefully no one's had Botox in the last few weeks. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and uh, have you noticed that there's, uh, there's a special group of people in the world that, uh, that can raise one eyebrow at the one time? Yeah, I'm sure you know who you are and you might want to show off that skill now if you're so inclined. It's your chance to shine. Um, and it is, it is quite a special elite group of people that have this skill. And I kind of think it's a little bit how we see creativity. This skill that, you know, this elite few group of people have, these creative geniuses that grace us with their presence. And I think that this idea is an incredibly destructive one. One of the times that I, I became really aware of it was uh, many years ago, I used to work in advertising. And I remember my first day on the job where, where my boss was showing me around to the different departments and, and kind of, you know, showing me who's who in the agency. And, uh, you know, she said, here's, here's account management. And, finance and his production and, and so forth. And, and then we got to this department that were dressed a little bit differently to everybody else. They were wearing shorts and thongs and t-shirts with controversial motifs written on them like, trust me, I'm Yoda or time travel agent or uh, one that I saw recently, uh, all your tweets are boring. <laughs> ultimate 21st century insult, isn't it? And she said to me, so this is the creative department. This is where our creative people sit. <laughs> and I remember thinking at the time, you know, I was employed to work in the strategy department, so does that mean that I wasn't or certainly shouldn't try to be creative? Hmm. And, and I think that what goes on in advertising is a bit of a microcosm for what goes on in the world, where there are these creative types, and then there's everybody else. And I think that this idea is an incredibly <laughs> damaging and disempowering one. In my opinion, one of, the, one of the most creative people that I've known in my life was my grandfather, Adam Imba. And funnily enough, my grandfather would, would never have described himself as having a creative bone in his body. You know, he just saw himself as someone that got stuff done, right? And uh, my grandfather was from a little town in Poland called Zolacek. And in January 1943, he came up with one of his best ideas. And it was in response to hearing the news that the Nazis would be about to be invading his town in about four months' time. And uh, as a Jew in World War II, not great news. So, you know, he, he thought about, well, you know, maybe we'll just move towns. You know, maybe, maybe we should do that. But then he thought, well, they'll probably just find us there. So instead, he thought, well, what if we went underground? Maybe they won't look for us there. So over the next four months, my grandfather set about building an underground bunker. It was about 15 metres long, it's so about the length of this stage. Two metres wide, so about sort of the, the width of two of those rows put together, about two metres tall, so a little bit taller than me. It's a joke, I'm a shorty, I'm five foot four. <laughs> Lots taller than me. And, uh, and at the end of four months, my grandfather and 24 of his closest friends and family went down to live in this bunker. The day after they went into the bunker was the day the Nazis invaded the town. So pretty good timing. There they lived for 361 days. My grandfather went out twice to get more supplies, but otherwise they were underground this whole time. And on the 361st day, they heard the voice of a British soldier coming from the sewers, and, and he was calling out to them, hello, is there anyone there? The war is over. The war is over. Can you imagine how sweet those words would have sounded after living in a box for one whole year? So out they all came. They'd survived the war. And what my grandfather found out a few months later was that from his little town in Poland, Zolacek, that prior to the war had a population of 14,000 people, only 50 of them survived. And half of those survivors survived because of my grandfather's bunker. And I often think just how lucky it is that despite my grandfather's lack of belief in his own creative ability, he, he was able to, to come up with implement, and implement this amazing idea that was responsible for saving half the survivors in his town. But, but I think that my grandfather is the exception rather than the rule, because I think that for the most part, due to the way that we kind of type creativity, we have these creative types and, and we you know, label it that way, I think that we're literally shortchanging the world of a bunch of great ideas. I think another reason why this happens is because the way we talk about coming up with, you know, the next big thing, we make it seem like really hard work. You know, like, you know, and, and you, like you have to have the word creative or innovation in your job title to, to possibly be able to come up with great ideas. And I mean, God help you if you've got a word like accountant in your job title, you know, there's not much hope for you then. But the good news is 
So what the latest scientific research shows us is that it doesn't actually have to be that hard. And in fact, anyone with a brain, one that's working, um, is capable of coming up with great ideas. And, and something that you should know about me at this point is that I'm, I'm a massive science geek. Um, I know, shock horror, you were thinking, she looks so cool and hip. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, I'm a massive geek, I love this stuff. I don't even remember, like, you know, back to university where you had all those academic journals drummed into you and they were full of, you know, jargon and statistics and numbers, and for the most part, you're quite happy to see the back of them. Well, for me, I love that stuff. Like, reading the latest issue of Journal of Occupational and Organisational Psychology, that's a top weekend for me. <laughs> um, and, and this obsession with science and numbers, it started from a young age, where uh, when I was about four years old, my absolute hero in the world was the Count from Sesame Street. <laughs> the Count? Oh, I love the Count. Yeah, I love the, the count gets a woohoo. You've got a ha ha. Um, and uh, I love the count so much so that I made my mum buy me this cloak and I would get around town dressed as the count. You know, fashion trendsetter I was. Um, anyway, I, uh, I counted my way through school and then ended up doing a bit of a life sentence in organisational psychology. Studied it for seven years. And, uh, and I imagine we've probably got some people in the, in the crowd here that have um, studied psychology and you might recognise this as the shorthand symbol for psychology. Um, and I look at that now and I think, God, that looks, looks like the devil's pitchfork, doesn't it? Um, but I try not to use my knowledge for evil, although having said that, I uh, know that I used to work in advertising. Um, but for the last, last few years, I've dedicated my life to, to understanding the latest scientific research from the field of creativity and innovation and understanding how, how we as, as normal human beings can have the ability to think more creatively and come up with better ideas. And I want to share some of these findings with you just to show just how easy it is for anyone to improve their ability to be a great creative thinker. Now, uh, at, at this point in time, we've known each other for a few minutes now, so it's probably a, a good point in time for me to make a bit of a confession. Um, so when I was about 12 years old, me and all my girlfriends were, were having, you know, our, our teenage crushes on, on you know, various people. And, and my girlfriends, for the most part, were having crushes on the usual suspects, like uh, Johnny Depp, who'd just done 21 Jump Street at the time. Remember that? Uh, and uh, Johnny Reeves, who'd just done a surf film called uh, Point Break. Anyone remember that? Oh, yeah. Clearly the oldest person in the room. Um, and, uh, and for me, though, I was sitting at home watching reruns of a British sitcom from the 1980s called The Young Ones. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And uh, I spent many, many hours watching this, uh, this sitcom about a group of four students, university students, sharing a, a household. And my teenage crush was on Vivian from The Young Ones. <laughs> Healthy applause. <laughs> um, and, and I don't know, like if it was the spiky red hair, because you know us redheads have to stick together, or, or you know the, the metal stars that he had stuck on his forehead, or his ability to knock down walls with a single headbutt. Um, but in any case, I was smitten. Um, but what I didn't realise at the time is that through watching Vivian on the TV screen for many, many hours, watching many, many reruns of The Young Ones, I was inadvertently increasing my ability to come up with great ideas. So this, was, uh, this concept was researched by a psychologist called Jens Forster, practicing out of, the, um, out of Germany. And uh, he was interested in the concept of the impact of exposing ourselves to certain types of images and the impact that has on our ability to generate great ideas. And he was specifically interested in a type of image that he called deviancy cues. <laughs> And, uh, and kind of to, to define what that means in, in psychology circles, deviancy is all about non-conformity as opposed to illegal activities and doing stuff that you know we mum catching you doing. Um, so non-conformity, deviancy cues. And he set up a study where he got a whole group of people in to solve a problem, generate as many solutions as they could. Half of those people were seated in front of a, a non-conformist or deviant kind of image, like a picture of a punk or like an image where there was an odd one out theme. And after just being seated in front of the poster, they then had to generate as many ideas as they could to this problem. The second group of people were seated in front of images that were all about conformity and blending in. And just after being seated in front of the poster, they then generated as many ideas as they could. What Jens Forster found is that the group that were seated in front of the, the non-conformist or deviant kind of images actually produced significantly more creative ideas compared to the conformity group but also significantly more ideas, in fact, 30% more ideas, just through being seated in front of a poster. These guys didn't even have to pay conscious attention to the poster, it was just there in front of them in the background, right? And so just through this simple act 
of exposing ourselves to non-conformist images, viewing non-conformist images where there's an odd one out theme or some sort of deviant theme, we significantly increase our ability to come up with great ideas. It's that easy. Now, uh, I can see a handful of you sitting in the room with your arms crossed, and, uh, and, and at this point in time, I'd actually like everyone to adopt that pose, okay? If you could sit there with your arms crossed, right? And, and when we cross our arms in life, there are a number of different reasons as to why we might be doing this. You know, like, uh, for example, we might just be comfortable, and you know, it's, it's a comfortable way to sit, that's fine. Sometimes we sit like this because we're a bit cold, and you know, the air conditioner's going, so maybe that's you. Um, you know, sometimes we sit like this because we're just not that into the person that we're sitting next to. I'm sure that's not you. Uh, and uh, other times we sit like this because we're, you know, striking a bit of a pose, trying to accentuate our biceps or our breasts. <laughs> and I'm sure there are no poses in this room. Uh, but what I would like you to do, on the count of three, is I'd like you to uncross your arms, okay? So one, two, three. Fantastic. And what you've done by doing that simple act is that you've doubled the speed with which you can solve creative challenges. Crazy. Um, so this was, this was research by a psychologist called Ron Friedman out of the University of Rochester, and he was interested in the impact on the body language has on our ability to be great creative problem solvers. So we set up a study where we had a couple of groups of people come into the lab and, and the first group of people were asked to sit there with their arms crossed while they solved a particular creative challenge. The second group of people were asked to sit there in kind of the opposite position with their arms open, with their hands on their laps, solving the exact same challenge. What Ron Friedman found is that the group that had that open body language with their hands on their laps solved the problem in half the amount of time compared to the arms crossed group. So by that simple act of unfolding or uncrossing our arms, we are doubling the speed with which we can solve any kind of creative challenge. So just remember that. The next time you're in a meeting and someone's sitting there like that, go, ah, oh, you're letting down the team. You're letting down the team. Get them to unfold their arms. Now, uh, think back to the beginning of this presentation. What was, uh, what was the simple thing that I asked you to do at the beginning? Eyebrows, raising your eyebrows, raising your eyebrows, and for uh, the show-offs, we raise one eyebrow. Yes, good. And what you might have noticed is that throughout this presentation, you might have been feeling a little bit more creative, right? Oh, I'll explain what's, what's going on there. So this was, this was kind of an interesting study that was done out of the University of Maryland, where um, they, were, they were thinking about what is a, a very widely known finding in, in um, innovation science research, and that if we can expose ourselves to a wide amount of information, like, you know, lots of diverse stimulus and events and experiences and so forth, we significantly improve our ability to come up with great ideas, because there's more diverse stuff going on in our brain, which can lead to more novel and effective combinations of ideas. So they're thinking about this, and they thought, what if we simply got people to kind of um, mirror that idea of going wide just through their facial expressions, right? Which they thought was the act of raising your eyebrows, where your eyes are really wide and you're you know, taking in all this information. So they set up a study where they, uh, they, they got these people in to, to solve a particular problem. They had half the group of people sitting there with their eyes, eyebrows raised, eyes really wide open just for two minutes, and then they had to generate as many solutions as they could to the problem at hand. And then they had another group of people do the opposite action, which would be burrowing your brow, sitting there like that, where your kind of eyes go a little bit more closed. And that group had to, to frown for a couple of minutes and then generate as many ideas as they could to this problem. What the researchers found is that the group that raised their eyebrows just for two minutes prior to embarking on this challenge produced significantly more creative ideas compared to the frowning group. So just through that simple act of raising your eyebrows, which everyone is able to do, I mean, with the exception of a few people in Hollywood, you're able to think more creatively. And I hope that what this stuff shows you is just how easy it is. You know, it's not about being a creative type, it's about having a brain and a face and a body. You know, it's as simple as viewing nonconformist images of unfolding your arms and raising your eyebrows, and you'll come up with significantly more creative ideas, significantly more ideas, in fact, 30% or more ideas, and you'll double the speed with which you can solve creative challenges just through these three things. And there are hundreds more studies like this that show us just how easy it is as humans to improve our creativity. And I hope that this makes you kind of think that, you know, the act of coming up with great ideas is not something that should just be reserved for those creative types amongst us, you know, but rather something that everyone is capable of doing. Because I feel that so far in this world, we've left the idea making to too few people. 
due to the act of labelling and making the, the creation of ideas seem really hard and really precious. And what we need to do is that we need to democratise creativity and open up this act of coming up with ideas to more people. We need to get more people solving more problems and putting more great innovation into the world. And most importantly, we need to let people know that anyone, even you, even my grandfather, who didn't think he had a creative bone in his body, is capable of great innovation. Thank you very much.